Would you turn to your neighbor before you take your seat and uh, just say, say to them, uh, Jesus has paid it all, grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters. Would you do that and then you can take your seat, amen? If you have your Bibles, I want you to open your Bibles to one of the most famous passages of Scripture, and that is Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to read these 10 verses that next to the 23rd Psalm, John 14, and several other passages of Scripture are probably some of the most familiar, famous passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. Now, I'm not going to preach on all 10 verses. I'm only going to do the first four or five verses. But I want to kind of set the frame for what we're talking about today. In the first chapter of the book of Ephesus, we, we looked at who Paul was writing to. He was writing to believers in a pagan city who needed encouragement in the Lord. And then beginning in verse 3, on down to about verse 12 or 13, he reminds them of all the blessings that they have because of their salvation. And then, if you'll notice, in verse 14 or 15, I believe it is, he reminds them of why he's thankful, why God has filled his heart full of gratitude. Now he comes to chapter 2. And he's going to remind them of the basic gospel of Christ. So if you would, Ephesians chapter 2, and let's look at verse 1. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course or the pattern of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand, in advance, that we should walk in them. And all the people said, Amen. I uh, read a study this week that I want to tell you about. There's been a lot of study on um, church attendance in these United States of America, and as you know, in the last 30 or 40 years, church attendance has slowly begun to decline over really since the 50s. And there's been a lot of study about why that is. And until recently, all the study had been on why people leave. And there's a whole myriad of reasons why people leave and uh, 
may or may not come back. But recently, there's been some really encouraging study on why people stay. What is it about those people who stay with Jesus, who never leave the church, who never leave the gospel, no matter how discouraging at times it can be, and no matter how frustrating it can be, and no matter how any of that can be. And uh, what this study says that and in all ages, 18 to 25, 25 to 35, 35 to 55, and 55 on up, there were, there were four or five common things that were true about this, this remnant of faithful people who stay with Jesus come, come what may. And the first thing about these people who, who walk with the Lord is that they have a clear understanding of a relationship with Jesus Christ. That they aren't, they didn't give their, themselves to an idea. They understand that what it means to be a Christian is to be committed to a person. This can happen in seminary. In seminary, I saw some friends of mine who were committed to ideas, the idea of God, the idea of Jesus rather than actually be committed to Jesus himself. And sometimes this can happen in church. We, we get theoretical ideas about, well, I, I believe in God. Well, if you believe in God, join every demon in hell. Every demon in hell believes in God. That's what the Bible says. But those people who are really walking with the Lord understand what it means to have a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ. It's personal. And at the heart of that, when you go underneath that, they understood the gospel. The gospel that we just read. That those people who know Jesus, who don't just have their name on a church roll, who stick with the Lord and His church, His bride, are those who not only know Jesus, but they know how to know Jesus through the gospel. And so what I want to do in these first few verses, if you would, look, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 2, and we're only going to go down to verse 5. I want to tell you some, some good news that begins with some really bad news. Okay? So before we can get to the good news, and it's going to be really good once we get there because the bad news is really, really bad. It's worse than you think. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, you're worse than you think. Can you do that? Amen? Amen. And some of you already knew that. Amen? So, so here, here's, the, here's these people that, that really know Jesus. And the reason they know Jesus is because they know how to know Jesus, and that's through the good news of the gospel. Well, why is it good news? Why did we call it the good news? Why is it called the gospel? Well, I want to show you. Look in verse 1. Notice our condition before we came to Christ. Notice if you were, well, in verse 1 it says, you were dead. Now, the word here, dead, you know what it means in the dictionary? In both the Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, it means dead. The Bible says in the Old Testament repeatedly, the soul that sins, it shall die. Romans 3.23 says that though we have missed the mark, that's the definition of sin. We are dead. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is dead. Death, not going to be dead. We are dead. Now, we have blood running through our veins. Our eyes open. We go to work. But without Christ, we are dead to God and God is dead to us. Sin kills. And it's not just going to kill it has already slain us. You ever been talking to a friend that you, you get the gospel? And have you been talking to them and they don't get it? 
They can't see it. Well, the Bible describes that as the blinders are on. The veil is still there. They are dead in their trespasses and sin. So if you have a relative, if you have a friend, if you have a co-worker, if you have a husband, if you have a wife, if you have a kid, and they don't get it, don't ever forget that outside of Christ, they are spiritually dead. Dead in what? Well, look what it says in verse 1. It says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. That is that the, that the, the, the holy God who has given us his holy law, we have transgressed his law. We have sinned against God. Ultimately, as David says in Psalm 51, our sins are against God. My sin may affect you. My sin affects my family, yes. But my sin ultimately is against God. Look what else it says. It says we're not only dead in our trespasses and sins, but it says that we were following... We were following the prince, the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, I don't know where you fall in, in, in believing in Satan and demonic powers. Uh, when I was in college, there was a guy that he emphasized Satan and demons so much that you would think there wasn't even a Jesus. But I want you to know that if you're a believer, you don't have to live very long to understand that, that Satan is real and there are demonic powers. Can I get a witness on that? And you know what Paul says here? Not only are we dead in our sins and in our trespasses, but guess who the puppet master is? The puppet master of pulling the strings of dead men and women is none other than than the prince of this world. Boy, that's a heavy one. Look at what it says in verse 3. He says, you once lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind. In other words, not only, not only are we dead, outside of Christ, are we dead in our trespasses and sins, not only is the puppet master, Satan and his demons, influencing what is already there, but Paul says that we, we're just left to fulfill the passions and our proclivities that come from our physical sexual, mental, relational appetites. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I, recently I've been watching the news, and sometimes, the, I'm talking local news, just the local news, and we'll flip from 17 to 2 to 4 to 5, and it's just the litany of wickedness. Can I get a witness on this? Kids, parents that don't know where their babies are, so-and-so robbed so-and-so, such-and-such did such-and-such, and it's enough to depress you. The great theologian D.K. Chesterton said one time that the sinful depravity of mankind is the most demonstrably provable fact in all of human history. So here Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he's going to remind them of the good news. We're going to get to some good news here. But the good news is really good because the bad news is really bad. It really is bad. There's one more thing I want to give right here before we get to the good news. This is devastating. Look, if you will, in verse 4. It says that we were pursuing our passions, mind and body, and we were by nature children of wrath. Like the rest of everybody else. Now this, this is going to make you really uncomfortable, but I want you to listen. I believe, just like you do, that God is love. And we're going to get to his love. 
But let me tell you something else about God. God is the righteous judge of the universe. God hates sin. And since God hates sin, he directs his judgment on sinners. You'll hear somebody say, well, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And that is true. But before you move too far into that, God isn't just going to judge sin. Who is he going to cast into hell in the book of Revelation? Sinners. Sinners sin. The Bible, and, and there is, I, I thought about bringing a whole list of the, of the verses that have the wrath of God in it. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Colossians 3.6 says that because of the sinfulness of man, they're building up wrath against that day. In Revelation, numerous times, it says that when the judgment of God comes and Jesus Christ comes to gather His church and to judge the nations, you know what it says? It says that every unbeliever will crawl under a mountain, go into a cave, and ask that it fall on them so they can escape the wrath of the Lamb of God. So before we hurry on to love and mercy and grace, you and I need to understand that there's another side of God that in His holy fury, He will judge sin and the sinner under His wrath. This is a bleak picture. Now let me answer some objections. Now pastor, this verse is talking about the really bad people. This verse is talking about Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or name whatever despot leader you could. That, that, this, this, this is reserved, this, this two or three verses is reserved for all the really bad people. But since I was raised in Nashville, Tennessee, and I, I, never, I never murdered anybody, I never, I never stole anything, I was a pretty good person, this, this, it, it surely can't be this bad. And that's a lie. It is this bad. I can only make this personal from my study of Scripture. But raised in a good home, with good parents... I don't get my righteousness from my family heritage. I'm not particularly good on my own. Prior to me coming to Christ, the wrath of God was against me. His judgment was upon me. And had I died... I would have gone to hell. You see, the Bible teaches not only is there the wrath of God and the judgment of God, but there is a place called hell and there is a place called heaven. And they are not very popular places, at least hell, and many people don't even care about going to heaven. Brothers and sisters, the bad news is really bad. And it doesn't matter who your parents were, how you were raised, that if you aren't in Christ, you're under the judgment of God. According to the Word of God. Let me give you another chapter and verse that is really unnerving to me. You remember in G John 3, Jesus talking to Nicodemus? 
in that famous verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he who believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. That's John 3, 16. Have you ever read John 3, 17, 3, 18, 3, 19? Jesus said, Nicodemus, I came into the world not to condemn the world. Whew, man, see there, Kevin, you're wrong. Now keep reading. Jesus said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. The world was condemned already because it had not believed in me. Under the condemnation and judgment of God. Let me give you a warning, brothers and sisters. And I'm talking to believers, professed believers. If you are sitting in the pew today and you have trusted anything and everything but God in His Son, Jesus Christ, if you have done that, I want to give you a warning. Judgment is coming on you. It is here. You're not saved because I'm a Baptist by choice and conviction. Proud to be a Baptist, but I'm not saved because I'm a Baptist. I'm not saved because I'm in a church building. I'm not saved because I do maybe a good worker here or two. I'm not saved because I was raised with godly parents. I'm not saved because I'm a preacher. I'm not saved because I may pray a little bit. I am only saved through Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. Anything else is filthy rag. And I warn you, brothers and sisters, do not say that you could stand in judgment and say, no preacher ever warned me. My name was on the church roll. I went to church all the time. I believed in God. And Jesus will say to you, like he said in Matthew 7, 21, depart from me, I don't know you. Lord, did we say, Lord, Lord? Did we not say, Lord, Lord? And Jesus says, I don't know you. You see, what we've done through the years is we've made the bad news not so bad. Through behavioral psychology, through sociology, even through some theology, we have diminished down this thing called sin and the wages of sin and the nature of sin and our nature. And on top of this, I want you to look at that word in verse 4. It says, and we are by nature children of wrath. That is, this is in our nature. The reason you need to be born again, get this now, get some good theology here. The reason Jesus said you need to be born again, he wasn't just making up some quaint saying. He was saying just like you were born with a physical nature, when your children are born, they have a biological, spiritual nature, right? Right? But because of sin, we're dead in our sin. And Jesus said, you must be born again. You must get a new nature. Because your old nature is only going to point you away from God. And lead you down a road you don't want to go. So, brothers and sisters, I, I warn us, I warn myself, I warn all of us. I, I, you know what? I, I'm going to join Paul. You know what Paul said about himself? Get this now. Here's the great apostle Paul, wrote 13 letters. You know what he said? He goes, wouldn't it be a travesty if I, having preached to many people, would find myself a castaway? That's why Paul wrote those verses. Hey guys, make your calling and election sure. Make sure you're not playing the spiritual game. You better make sure that you know the gospel and you know the Christ. You see, Paul wanted to remind this church. And he wants to remind the remnant today. That the reason we can stick with Jesus is because Jesus is the only way out of this predicament. And I want to give you four or five words. Here they go. This is the really good news, okay? Y'all bad news? I know the, you got the look on some of your faces like, Stop! Stop! It's bad. No, it's bad. It's bad. It's bad. Don't, don't con God. Don't play games. But I got some good news for you. I want you to look, if you will, and I, I love this. Would you please look in verse 4? And we're all going to say this together. It's a conjunction 
So in verses 3, 1 through 3, he gives us some really bad news. But in verse 4, he begins, but God. Would you look at your neighbor and say, but God. Amen. That we have a conjunction, and the conjunction here is going to tie together two ideas about bad news and good news. So, so here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the great irony of God's sovereign saving plan. God, whose judgment is against sinners, is the only one who can remedy this problem. I can't. You can't. So here's what God, the God who would judge us and whose wrath is upon us does something that's novel. Let me bring it into the modern era. If God's the judge, God is behind the bench, he's got his robes on. He has every right to throw the law book at us. But our judge steps out from behind the bench and he brings his robe, the robe that represents righteousness and justice and law. And he comes out from behind the bench and here I am, a poor wicked sinner standing before the judgment bar of God and God steps out from behind the bench and undeservingly puts his robe on me and declares me not guilty. Can y'all get that? Are you awake? Wake up. But God. I told y'all this story. I'll tell it to you again. I haven't told it in a long time. I got, when I was in college, I was dating Janet. I got a speeding ticket. I know y'all find that hard to imagine. And, I, and, it, and it was one of those crazy things. I think it was a speed trap. It was 35 and it was a 25 in a school zone and I was going like two miles and over and the old county sheriff guy, he was writing this ticket quota. God bless this ridge top. But anyway, and so I got this ticket and I have to go appear before the judge. Well, I, I didn't show up. I forgot all about it. And the policeman, the very nice policeman, show up at the Baptist Student Union looking for the Baptist preacher kid. <laughs> hey, we're looking for Kevin. I show up, hey, Kevin, the police are here looking for you. I'm like 18 years old. I said, I'm going to be good citizen Joe. I'm going to go down to the cat, you know, the police. I go down there. They were so nice. Those policemen, they invited me behind the desk. I said, this is cool. I'm going to get a private tour of the jail. And I said, well, can you, he was filling out some paper. I said, well, can you, you failed to appear. I said, for what? We well, got this speedy to get so, so. I was like, well, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. So I have to go before the judge. And I go before the judge. And he pulls out, I've got some case number. Don't go look in Missouri. i got a case number in Missouri. And I, you know, here's the traffic ticket. And he calls me, Kevin Shrum, case, case. I go up for the, I mean, I'm standing at this big old bench. And I'm standing there. He goes, Mr. Shrum, you failed to go on to, how do you plead? How do you plead? Now, Prior to me giving my plea, a bunch of people had come up there and argued with the judge. Y'all ever seen this? Well, I really didn't mean it. The dog ran over. My wife kicked me. Went on the way out. It was a bad day. All this. And he and I walked up there. And I said, and he, man, he was not a, in a happy mood. I walked up there. He said, sir, how do you plead? Sir, your honor, I am absolutely and fully guilty. And it got really quiet. And he looked down, put his note, he put it down. He closed my file. He said, Mr. Shrum, because you've been willing to be honest with this court. And he slapped the gavel. He said, I declare you not guilty. You don't even have to pay the fine. I didn't have the fine anyway because I was a poor college student. Can I get a witness on that? <laughs> Isn't that what God wants of us? But God... The only one who can remedy this is willing to. The one who could judge us has saved us. Look at these other words. But God who is rich in mercy, underline mercy. Now we're going to get to grace, but you know what mercy is? 
Mercy is a form of pity. It, the, the word is interesting. It's actually a visceral term. It, it's a gut-wrenching term. Like you have, you have, you see someone in distress and you, and you have pity on them. And the word mercy can mean, I'm going to withhold from you what you deserve. You, you deserve such and such, but because I'm merciful, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And so this great God, under whose judgment we are, he steps out of his judge role and because of his mercy decides not to give us what we deserve. Love. Look what it says there. It says, because of his great mercy and the love with which he loved us. The word here, love, is, is the word agape. It, it carries with it the meaning of a sacrificial, giving kind of love. So this God under whose judgment we live without Christ, has decided to save sinners. And the way he does it is the first thing he does is he withholds from them what we deserve. And he gives to us sacrificially, and we know where this gift is, it's in Jesus Christ. So let me rehearse this. We sinned and we're under his judgment. You know what Jesus did? Jesus came and lived our life perfectly without sin. And yet on the cross, on the cross, Jesus, listen, Jesus was treated as if he had sinned so that he could treat us as if we had never sinned. You say, Pastor, give me chapter and verse. Romans 3, 21 through 24. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That's love. And grace. And grace. Grace. It's a gift. It's giving to us what we do not deserve. Did you get that? God, but God, encounters these sinners living by our passions, dead in our trespasses and sins. And while we were stiff-arming God, we're better stiff-armer than Derrick Henry is. Running down the field, just stiff-arming people out of the way. We've been stiff-arming God Get out of my way, God. Here's the good news. God did not give us what we deserve. He gave us sacrificially His life through His Son. And instead, He gave us what we do not deserve. And that's He saved us. He saved us. I want to begin, end where I begin. How do you stick with Jesus? How are they going to stick with Jesus? How do you stick with Jesus when your marriage is falling apart? How do you stick with Jesus when your kids are prodigals? How do you stick with Jesus when the world seems to be going awry? How do you stick with Jesus when even your own sins catch up with you? How do you do that? And the way you do that is you know the gospel that the gospel is really good news. And the reason it's so good is because the bad news is really bad. It's bad. But God, 
who is rich in mercy did not give us what we deserve. Because of His great love, He gave us the gift of His Son. And because of His great grace, it's all unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of a loving, holy, righteous God so that when our great God sees us, when we come to Christ, instead of being children of wrath, He has called us friends. He has called us sons and daughters of the Most High God. He has adopted us into His family. He has infilled us with His Spirit of God. He has sealed our hearts. He has given us an inheritance that is far above all things. He has forgiven us forgiveness of sins. He has taken our wickedness away. He has cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. Jesus Christ is Lord. And Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us on the cross, buried, raised from the dead, victorious, interceding for us even now. This is the good news, brothers and sisters. So here's my word to you. If you do not know Christ, I have a warning for you, and I say this with love. If you do not know Christ, if there is any doubt in your mind, Come, come now, come now, come now in just a few moments during the invitation or right after service, come to Christ, come to Christ now. You don't, you're not promised the next minute, the next hour, the next day. And dear Christian friend, Preach the gospel to yourself. You say, Pastor, I'm beyond the gospel. If you're beyond the gospel, you're, you're amazing. I have to preach the gospel to myself every day. To remind myself that when my old nature tries to flare up, now I have the Spirit of God. Satan, the, the accuser of the brethren. Can I preach now? Satan, the accuser of the brethren, will come and hop his... Self on my shoulder and say, Kevin, you are no good, rotten, knuckleheaded, self-centered, self-serving kind of guy. And I agree with him, but I say something's happened to me. The Lord of the universe, but God, who was rich in mercy and his great love, he gave me his mercy and his grace in Jesus Christ. And Satan, you can go straight to hell where you're going to spend the rest of eternity under the judgment of this great God. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, you ought to get happy today in the Lord because even though the bad news is really bad, the good news is really, 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 really. Have I told you that it's good? Amen. Can I get a witness on that? Because of his great love and grace. Do you know him? Preach the gospel to yourself. You know what my goal is? My goal for you and me is I want to finish. You want to finish? You want to finish? I want to finish. I want to finish my walk with the Lord. I want to finish my marriage. I want to finish being a dad. I want to finish being a grandfather. I want to finish being a pastor. I want to finish. I don't want to. I want to be faithful. And I'm able to do that because I remind myself of who I was before and what I am now. But God made the difference. Would you stand? Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Let me pray for us. Praise team's going to come. You've already heard the invitation. Dear friend, if you're not sure, you come right now. Take my hand and say, Pastor, I want to make sure that I know Christ. If you're looking for a church home, you need a church home, come on. You come on right now. Say, Pastor, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm, but I need a church home. I need a, I need a, this is my place right here. Make this official. Not just going to be an attender. Dear Christian, do you need to stand there and preach the gospel to yourself? Just to remind yourself that 
It's not through your righteousness or mine or ours or we and or you and our essence. It's because of his righteousness in Jesus Christ that we are saved. That though our sins be many, his mercy is more. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to lift our heads and our eyes and our voices. And we're going to sing this invitation hymn. And while we're singing, you come. You come to pray. Whatever reason God is speaking, let me pray. Father, thank you for this good word. I needed, if nobody else in the house needed this word, Kevin Shrum needed this word, that I was dead in my trespasses and sins, that I, that I was being messed around by the puppet master of this world, the prince of the power of the darkness, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, but you, O oh God, you stepped into the gap and through your son, Jesus Christ, because of the great love with which you loved us, you gave us mercy and grace. Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He was raised from the dead, victorious over sin and death. He intercedes for us now. Lord Jesus, you're coming back for us one day. And until then, we will live for you under your mercy, under your grace, for your glory. And Father, I pray, I pray that you would strengthen every believer. I pray that you would strengthen your church, every mom, dad, child, every person here, that you would bless them as they walk with you. Lord, let us sing. You call them as they come. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together, lift your voices. Let's sing this beautiful hymn. Remember no wrong we 